Hi, it's Steph. Today's guest is Lisa C. Willis. She was a WNBA basketball player, a former UCLA star, author, and speaker. She also made history as the first female coach of a New York Knicks franchise, the Westchester Knicks, the official NBA G League affiliate. She's now at Nike. She's reflective, she's introspective, and has insights to share about sports at all levels of play, the business of professional sports, life after sports, why resilience is her favorite word, and what happens to a player's performance or any person's sense of self when they feel valued. She is not only about scoreboard victories, she is about life victories. As the Another Door Opens name implies, this podcast is about opening our hearts and our minds to the people, ideas, and world around us so that we can all live our lives with a little more ease and grace. During each episode you listen to, I encourage you to move if you can, in any way you can. Take a walk, stand up, sit down, stretch, extend your arms, wiggle your toes, practice your smile, or mindfully move your breath. All of these are forms of opening. This is the Another Door Opens podcast, and I'm your host, Stephanie Himango. Here is Lisa C. Willis. Lisa C. Willis, L-I-S-A-C-W-I-L-L-I-S. Awesome. And what do the words Another Door Opens mean to you, if anything? It just means opportunity. It just really means opportunity and When I think about doors being open, I think about you having to walk through the door. It's totally awesome to have another door open, but it means nothing if you're not going to do the work to pick up your left foot, then your right foot, then your left foot, and walk into the door. I get excited for all the doors that open for me, but shortly after that, I calculate the work that goes into it. We're all experiencing some pretty significant transitions right now. And I know you are on a personal level too, because you recently started a new job and moved to a new city, right? Correct. So I recently moved to Portland, Oregon. I work at Nike now, and I'm an associate product line manager for men's basketball. And so you have NBA, and then you have all the other men's basketball leagues and teams. And that's what I work on as far as jerseys and apparel. So anything you see the players wearing, that's what I work on. And this, of course, after being a WNBA basketball player and professional coach, as well as recently becoming an author with your book Mm -hmm. titled When the Buzzer Sounds, A Guide to Transition Players from the Court to Life After Hoops. I do want to get to the book in a little bit and why you wrote it. But first, can we sort of bounce back to your basketball career a little bit and talk about that? I know you had a decorated high school and college career. You went on to play in the pros. I'm just curious, how old were you when you started playing basketball and how big did you dream in those early days? Oh, wow. I was eight years old when I started playing basketball and there was no WNBA at the time. I would say around nine, 10 years old. I dreamed really big. I was like, I'm going to be the first woman in the NBA, you know. And then shortly after the WNBA came along. But I never actually aspired to play in the W. I wanted to play at UCLA. And so that was like my biggest dream for basketball is just playing at UCLA. I had to look up when the WNBA came into existence. It was in 1997 that the first two WNBA teams met each other on the court. Those teams were the New York Liberty and the Los Angeles Sparks. Did you have role models or mentors at that point? Do you remember in those early days, not necessarily when you were eight, but sort of through those early years? I had players that I looked up to. I had players that I would study different parts of their games. But I I have a family that always pushed me, letting me know that I could do and be whatever I wanted. And so I think that was probably more beneficial for me or more impactful for me than actually the players that I was looking up to. Because I knew that if I set my mind to it and couple that with hard work, I could do it. And you did it. (laughs) I did. (laughs) You went to to UCLA and beyond. What position did you play? And how would you sort of describe your basketball run at UCLA? 
So I was a shooting guard on paper. I was a shooting guard. But because I was one of the taller players on the team, I had a pretty good IQ and I wanted to be a versatile player. I really played all the positions. I didn't like it so much, especially not banging with the big girls, but I played all the positions. On paper, I was a shooter. It's interesting because I started off playing basketball as a point guard. But as I played up and with better teams, you know, they already had a point guard. And so they pushed me over to the shooting guard position. And then voila, it was recognized that I could shoot the ball very well. And I have read your book, so I have a little insight into how much work went into that. Can you talk a little bit about how disciplined you were in those young years and maybe how your mindset changed during that time? It seems like maybe as a really young one, you weren't so into that diligence, but then you realized it benefited you. Right. My discipline came from from failing. I started off pretty good. And then, you know, when you're playing Parks and Rec, pretty good is pretty good. Then when you go to club basketball and it's a little bit more competitive, then that's when you get your real evaluation. And so I was sought after. I went to this tryout and I literally left the gym crying, literally. And I never wanted to experience that again. And so needless to say, I didn't make the team, but I went home and, you know, I sat down and wrote up a basketball training regimen. So I was my first trainer ever. And I wrote that regimen and I did it every single week. Um, Mm -hmm. I tracked my results, like how many left hand layups did I make, right hands, jumpers, free throws, all of that. And that was really when I started to realize that hard work and discipline will actually get you the results that you want. Because a year later, I went back and I made that very same team. Wow. And in your college years, even high school, even pro, did you keep a morning routine? Are you like, did you have a pre or post game ritual that you did? Is there something that you carved out to sort of give yourself what felt like a leg up? Yes, it's a follow through form shooting routine. And so I equate it to people stretching before the game. Like nobody in their right mind just goes out on the court or the field without stretching. And for me as a shooter, I'm not going to just step out on the court and start shooting the ball. So I say I'll warm up my jumper. And so I would get, I know at UCLA uh, and even in the WNBA, I would get to the gym and I'd be on the court at least an hour before anybody even showed up to the gym just to warm up my jump shot. And that was just me making the ball perfectly. So no rim, no backboard, just perfectly all net. It was maybe eight to 10 different locations, just working my way, starting in close and working my way back. And I still do that to this day. If I could go to the gym and play basketball right now, before I started running up and down the court, I would do the same workout. And why did you do that? Why did you think that would work? And why did that work for you? First of all, psychologically, I saw the ball go in so many more times than Mm -hmm. I would even shoot in the game. You know, and so it's not like if I miss my first shot of the game, it's like, dang, not like, oh, I'm off today. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just a simple dang. And then I can be resilient. I could bounce back because I already saw the ball go in at least 100 times already, you know, and then just to work on my touch and to get used to the arena or wherever I was playing at. And so how did that transition, speaking of transitions earlier, go for you from college to the pros? Were there scouts involved? What happens? There were scouts. I know that when I played on the USA team, my stock went up. I didn't know that I was being looked at for the WNBA until one day I was, we were going to play somebody at the World University game and Simone Augustus, like a superstar, she was talking about, you know, where everybody's going to get drafted to. And so she said, Willis, you're probably going to go number nine to Sacramento. And I'm like, well, gosh, I'm the only Willis on this bus. <laughs> so you must be talking <laughs> about me. Oh my gosh. And so I was, I was baffled. But playing on the USA platform, that gave me even more exposure. And so I actually went higher than number nine. I went number five to the L.A. Sparks. And uh, the GM at the time said, that she made some trades just to ensure that she could get me. 
because she didn't think she'd be able to get me at a later pick. What teams overall did you play for in the WNBA? And what was your experience overall with playing in the pros? So I did two years with LA, two years with the New York Liberty. And then after getting cut from the Liberty, I did just a two-week contract. A player was hurt. I did a two-week contract with the Sacramento Monarchs. And the experience was different. Like, there's a great sense of accomplishment that comes with playing at the highest level, you know, in the best league in the world. But it was a business. It, it was a business, you know, and going from college where you're, you're singing Kumbaya and everybody needs to get along and we're eating all of our meals together and, you know, we're doing team bonding and just trying to have a good time so that we could play better on the court. Going from that to show up to work, do your job, go home. If you want to have drinks and eat dinner afterwards with your coworkers, then do that. If not, see you tomorrow on time for practice. That was just a really, really different feel that I hadn't experienced before. Because at this point, it's a job, it's a business. And if you can't serve the organization, you know, the way that they saw when they picked you up in the first place, then your job's on the line. And so with the W, I mean, we're, and I'm sure with the NBA and our other professional athletes, but with the W, especially because we don't make as much money, we're fighting for health care. We're fighting to put food on our tables. The contracts aren't guaranteed. And so it's just a different feeling. And how did your career in the WNBA end? I had recently been cut from the LA Sparks. That's technically how it ended. But then I was going to go back overseas and play. And the day that I got the contract that I wanted, that was when I tore three ligaments in my knee. Oh, man. In your mind, did you think, okay, I need to make a change. I need to find something different. It was really tough because that was exactly what I was thinking. That thought process, that line of thinking didn't account for the emotions that went into this huge loss that I just suffered from. I didn't properly grieve the loss of basketball. And basketball was my longest relationship. Mm -hmm. Outside of my family, that was my longest relationship, my first love, you know, what I did for fun, what I did to be social, what I did for health, what I did for a living. It was so many things. And I simply said what you said, okay, I need to find something else. And so without properly mourning the loss of that, I fell into a depression. And on the outside looking in, a lot of people wouldn't have been able to see that. But those close to me, they, they knew I was like a zombie just a shell of Lisa Willis. Did you feel like you had thrown all of your eggs into a basket of identity that was, I am a basketball player? I felt like I was on a never ending mission to not do that. And I think that was why I didn't properly grieve the loss. I didn't want it to be like, oh no, Lisa Willis is done with basketball. What is she going to do next? ball is life. I didn't want that. And so I just tried to minimize that loss. I think the opposite of what you're saying is really what caused me to, to fall into that depression was trying not to be seen as just a basketball player. Got it. And so I know that you have talked about the fact that it's kind of a knee jerk reaction that people may have from the outside to say, okay, you are a player, you're going to coach. Was that something that you wanted to do, sort of fell into, kind of talk about that move from the end, maybe grieving part of it, not grieving part of it, realizing you didn't grieve it and moving on to something other than actually playing basketball. What happened in there? Yeah. I mean, I, I knew after I was done playing that I didn't want to coach. I knew that I was adamant about that. I had a basketball training company. So I worked on skills, development, IQ, the wins, the victories that I got with my players individually were way better than what I could imagine winning as a team. You know, I was, I'm all about personal growth. And so that was my lane that, you know, I wanted to be in. However, once I did end my career and I was in a slump, I had a lot of different opportunities to coach that I just kept closing the door to. And so I finally said, you know what, let's just take this job. 
let's just take this job. And so I went to North Carolina to coach at Montreat College, a small Christian school in the mountains. And I said, give it 10 months. Just confirm then that you don't want to coach. And so 10 months later, I confirmed that I didn't want to coach. It was not a good experience for me. I went from assistant coach to head coach very quickly. But the way that I did it, it just didn't feel good. It just really confirmed I didn't want to coach. And so I moved to the D.C. area where I continued my basketball training company. And I got approached about four years after arriving to be the coach at T.C. Williams. I don't know if you remember the movie, Remember the Titans, Mm -hmm. but (laughs) that's where I was coaching. Yeah. And so I fought so hard. I mean, the athletic director asked me three different times and I told him (laughs) three different times, no, (laughs) like (laughs) it's not, this isn't going to be a good look. But I prayed about it and ended up taking the job. And that's how I started coaching. Do you find that you liked it better then than your North Carolina experience? Because you had resisted it and you said in really bold letters, I don't want to coach. <laughs> right. How did, how did that change or did that change? It changed because I had an athletic director that seemed supportive to what I was trying to do. I didn't have that in the initial coaching job. And so this way I was able to really instill some of the life lessons that I think are really important. The things that I learned from basketball, I was able to instill those in my players and I had the support of the athletic director. Now, it definitely helped that we were winning, Mm -hmm. you know, but we were winning because I was able to get them to buy into the leadership skills. So, yeah, I mean, I fell in love with the girls, even though they were hard headed and knuckleheads. <laughs> I fell in love with them and I just wanted to be a better coach for them. And so you you just mentioned leadership. And I know that one thing you told me is you haven't always been only about scoreboard victories, but personal victories. How did you become more intentional about the things you were teaching your players that weren't directly basketball. I just wanted to give them all the things that I was feeling as a player, but they weren't necessarily tangible. I'm a very reflective person and I understood that I'm not super fast. I'm not athletic. I'm not even an athlete. Like I'm a hooper. And so what are these things that made me successful? If I'm going to be a basketball trainer and help players get to the next level, I need to know like what really worked for me outside of just shooting. Because there's a lot of people who can shoot well, but they're not successful. So what was it? And so I started to really think about those things. And it's like, okay, how can I get a level up or get get a leg up as a trainer? But then ultimately, how can I make my players feel confident in themselves and feel valued as a person, not just as an athlete while on the basketball court and off. And so I just became more intentional about the things that made me feel valued. And how did I, you know, attack some of these emotions that I had to deal with on the court. And that became the way that I trained players or coach players as well. From your experience, when you showed your players that you valued them. What did that do to their performance? Oh my goodness. They performed. They absolutely performed. I was able to get some players to do things that other coaches hadn't been able to get them to do just because I know what it feels like when a coach believes in me. It's like, it's almost like Popeye when he gets his spinach. (laughs) Like that belief that a coach gives you is vital. You know, because if you think about it, when a player makes a mistake, they look at the coach like, oh, man, are you going to take me out? Are you going to yell at me? Are you going to put your head down? Like, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. And so that alone shows where players are getting some of their confidence from. And so I knew that most times I didn't have the coach that was going to react in a positive manner. And so I said, As a coach, I'm always going to react in a positive manner. That doesn't mean I don't discipline the players, but if they mess up on the court, I'm just going to like, you know, to describe it, it says that I'm frowning my face, but it's like, you got this. Like, and I'm going to clap my hands three times. Like, you got this. Mm -hmm. And then that lets them know 
you got this. I'm not mad. Let's get it back and let's keep going. You know, and so I always try to build my players up in the game. And then before we even get to the game, just let them know, like, we talked about your goals. I see what's important to you. And so I'm going to try to push you to do what you say that you want to do. We're a team. Yes, I'm the coach, but we're a team when it comes to you reaching your goals. And so how has that desire to sort of pour your love and energy into other people become a leadership-based career path for you as well? You're doing more than coaching basketball. You were doing more than coaching basketball. You are doing more than coaching basketball. It seems like a lot of those values and characteristics that you developed and fostered over all of your years of playing basketball and the insights you are able to gain have now become sort of your bag of tools that you can use to build this whole new future you're setting up. Yeah, I mean, leadership is simply put as influence. Now, there are more profound definitions, but, you know, the best ones, in my opinion, they include influence. And so it's it's really hard to influence somebody if they don't like you, you know, or if they don't respect you or if they don't know that you care about them. Yes, there are people who will listen to you because of your position, but I don't want you to listen to me because of my position solely. I want you to listen to me because you know that what I have for you is good. I think as athletes, we don't quite realize how much we learn about life when we're in the process of having a hard practice or a fun game, a win, a loss, et cetera. But I really do think people who come up in sports and not solely sports, but I came up playing sports and I realize I think more and more as I get older, how much I did learn just by doing it. And I didn't even know I was learning it. Are there any top takeaways for you That when you say, when I look back on my life in sport, these are the most important characteristics or traits I developed or the most important things I learned from all of those collective experiences. My sister, she would laugh right now because she knows my favorite word is resilience. Mm. She'll ask me something and then she's going to say, I already know you're going to say resilience. And I'm like, well, why did you ask me? But resilience, I am a truly a resilient person because of basketball. Like on the court, I call it the get it back on defense mentality because typically, you know, when you're on offense, you might try to do something, you get beside yourself and you turn the ball over. That's not the time to put your head down. You have to quickly get it back on defense. And I just found that thought process has helped me when maybe I'm trying some kind of business endeavor. And it doesn't go the way that I want. It's like, ah, that does suck a little bit. Let's get it back on defense. You know, let's go back to, you know, what I know I can be successful at. And then we'll try something else again. Resilience has been something that I really learned from basketball and reflecting. Watching game film was brutal for me. It was totally brutal because nobody really likes to see the mistakes that they make. And watching the mistakes, once I finally committed to being better, I had to. I had to actually see it to know like, okay, this is what's going on. And because I was a reflective person as a player, that helped me become a better player. And now I'm not so scared to, you know, review bad relationships, bad business deals, just things that I did on my own. Like, it's like, okay, let's take a hard look at these things. And, you know, let's see what we did well. Let's see what we didn't do well. And then let's come up with a game plan from there. Those two things really helped. And then just to add one more, I would say the teamwork component, just understanding how to work as a team. There's so many different personalities, which means you can't talk to everybody the same way. They don't communicate the same way. You know, they get pumped up in different ways. You know, and so just understanding how to work, to be one of a collective group and to still do your part to push things forward without being selfish about it or whatnot, really think that the teamwork helps me in other areas. I liked so much your comment in the book and just now about get it back on defense. I was not a basketball player and I didn't play team sports per se. I was 
diving, gymnastics, and track. So those are more individual. But I definitely understood what you were saying about get it back on defense. And it really helped me so much because one thing I'm starting to realize about myself is that I need to recover faster, whether it's from physical fitness or from something, some kind of an emotional hit that happens in my life. And your get it back on defense gave me a context to think about it. Like I I saw things happen at the end of one court and I saw you having to get it back as you started to run down the other way. (laughs) Did I get that right? Absolutely. (laughs) Okay. But I found that really helpful. And I found so many things, frankly, in your book to be helpful. And so I, I wanted to transition to that a little bit. You wrote this book, When the Buzzer Sounds, A Guide to Transition Players from the Court to Life After Hoops. Why did you write this book? So I wrote this book because there were so many emotional components. A lot of times once athletes are done playing their sport, whether that's high school, college, professionally, there's a sense of just worthlessness. We listen to how great we were as football, basketball, baseball, whatever, players. And it's like now all those praises are gone. Everybody's seen me in this light. But now who I am as a person is in the dark. And sometimes we can't even see who we are as a person. And so, you know, that transition from playing sports to going into what other people call the real world, it's scary. We don't always realize that we're ready. You know, and so I wrote it because I had a tough time transitioning from from sports to life after. And once I realized, like, no, like, I'm ready for what this world has to offer because of all of these things that I experienced in the court, then things got so much better for me. And you have taken all that you've learned and you've you've become a speaker and you have embraced leadership and you have embraced training other people to be leaders or to enhance their leadership. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Now this transcends sport completely what you're doing. Because I had to take control of my life. And I found that the first follower of any leader is oneself. And so I deal with a lot of self-leadership and getting the individual to feel good about what they have to offer themselves. Now, these individuals, they might go on to become leaders or they just might be in control of their own lives. And I think that's that's really important. One thing that I talk about when I'm doing some of these leadership training is I came up with this performance quadrant where basically on the left side, you have the participant mentality and the right side, you have the key player mentality. And without going all the way into it, when you're playing the game of life, do you want to participate or do you want to be a key player? It's your life. And so that was like kind of my mentality when it came to leadership. Like first things first, let's be the leader of our own lives so that now we could be a key player and a key influencer in what you know we want to happen in our lives instead of just going with the wind. And then from there, you know, there's management training and all that stuff. But I'm most passionate about people just being in control of their own lives. I love this concept so much, being in control of our own lives. I just want to share that I remember being introduced to this concept as an adult when I read a book by author Robin Sharma called The Leader Who Had No Title. I really took this message to heart. We don't need a title to lead, not just ourselves, but even other people. We can lead by example. We can exercise patience and courage and critical thinking. We can create space between an action and a reaction to allow room for our best self, our thoughtful, caring self, to act in a way that's congruent with who we really want to be. The intention may not be leadership, but in living thoughtfully, we can, by default, lead. I find this stuff really exciting. So I wanted to ask Lisa, what excites her when she thinks about the future and leadership training and using her own unique skill set? It's really exciting when I see the light bulb go off in people's heads. Like I do extensive research on leadership and psychology and stuff like that. But when I present it, you know, I present it like 
in a very casual manner. And so it could be understood and speaking on the same frequency as everybody. And just being able to see the different things that resonates with people and then to have them maybe email me or, you know, contact me through social media months or weeks later telling me how, you know, things have been different because of the leadership training. That's what's exciting for me. Like the more that I can get that, the better, because I know how it feels to feel like I'm not in control. All of these circumstances are are controlling my life instead of me grabbing the circumstances and controlling that. That's just what's really, really exciting to me, just being able to help somebody take control. If I can read just a short section from your book, very short, that I feel like says that same thing and is very hopeful. It gives me hope that anytime something's ending, there is more after it, which is sort of the concept of this another door opens idea for all of us. I really love this line. The buzzer is necessary. It lets you know when it's time to evolve or move on, but it doesn't mean your game is over. What inspired you to write that line? It's not over. (laughs) It's not over. Now you're just going into a different phase. And I felt like that was probably one of the most important lines of the whole book, because like I said, that transition, there is a lot of emotion that goes into transitioning from an athlete to, we'll say, a civilian or really any transition in life, going from familiar waters to uncharted territories. Like you're just taking what you've had, what you've used before that made you successful or some challenge areas that you've grown from and you're just using that to continue on. Maybe your uniform might change. You might go from wearing a jersey to a business suit, a jersey to scrubs, a jersey to whatever, but the game is still going on. That game is your life. So insert your name, the life of insert your name, that's the game. And within your life, you have different games. And the better you're able to transition, the better off you will be. And I love that that very message is conveyed in the title of the book. I love that somebody can look at the book title when the buzzer sounds and they'll get a notion that you are translating that to a beginning instead of an ending. Mm Mm-hmm. You're in a new chapter of your life. And so are there a few ideas or tips that you'd like to share that help you sort of set your brain and reframe things so that you can start off on a good footing? Yeah, I'm in complete learning mode right now. I have a new job. Nike is a universe of its own. And so I'm just really trying to learn, 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 learn so that you know, I can be super efficient in my work and be a true contributor. As a basketball player, I know when I was very young, my dad would take me to all of these basketball games and I wouldn't be sitting there as a fan. I'd be sitting there as a student just learning, like what defense are they in? They need two points. What should they do? Like what's being discussed at the timeout? All of these things help me to become a better player. That's where I'm at right now with Nike and with programs related to the book and public speaking, just trying to learn as much as I can so I can be great at what I do. The success that I had on the basketball court, I would love to surpass that amount of success in my future. And it starts with learning. Looking back from where you are today, is there a door that in retrospect you are glad closed? What comes to mind is just some opportunities or some favor that I would have liked to receive from coaches that I did not receive. And I'm happy that I didn't receive it. I've never been the coach's favorite. You know, as a player, it's like, man, can I just get one coach that that lets me slide? One coach that is not on my back super hard. And I never got that. I never got that. And Because I didn't get that, like I'm grateful that I didn't get that because now I know how to work. Now I know how to pay attention to details. I know how not to take plays off. And plays is like, let's say days off or assignments off. Like I know how to not get weary 
in trying to, you know, be successful because of that. And so that's not quite a door, but that's something that I wanted that I did not get. And in retrospect, I'm grateful that I did it because it's, it's helped me with the work ethic that I currently have. That is really good. Before we wrap up here, here is where you can find Lisa C. Willis online. Awesome. So on social media, on Twitter and Instagram, I am Lisa Willis 40. My website is lisacwillis.com. And that's also where you can get the book. You can go straight to lisacwillis.com backslash the buzzer. And you were number 40, weren't you? I was number 40. I love it. I love your perspective. I, I love that you've taken so many years of, I know you worked really hard and you are translating it into something brand new. And I know that isn't easy, but I think it's bold and I think it's brave and I think it's cool. And I'm really excited for you. And I'm, I'm just so grateful that we could connect this way so you could share some of those riches with us. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This has been great. Lisa C. Willis, thank you. Everyone, make sure you check out her book and get it through her website, When the Buzzer Sounds, A Guide to Transition Players from the Court to Life After Hoops. I'll put the link for it in the show notes. I'll be posting a few pictures related to this episode on my social media pages, like always. So follow on Instagram and Twitter at Steph Hemango and at Podcast ADO. If you want to, take a second to share this episode with someone and rate and review it on Apple. To my Patreon supporters, thank you again for believing in the power of story and supporting the show. If you're interested in becoming a patron too, you can go to patreon.com slash another door opens to find out some of the options there starting at a dollar a month. I'll put that in the show notes as well. Those another door opens drum beats were made by the amazing Eric Brown. And that is this week's episode of the Another Door Opens podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Think about how you can practice opening in your life today. And I'll do the same. I'll see you next time. Love you. Bye.